Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 291, The Soviet-Afghan War. Last time, we interviewed Professor Valeria Sobel, author of Haunted Empire, Gothic and the Russian Imperial Uncanny. Today, though, we're going to cover a more controversial topic, the Soviet-Afghan War, a conflict that many believe helped accelerate the dissolution of the Soviet Union. This will not be an episode that goes into detail about the actions within the war, like the battles fought. It will be more about the reasons for the conflict, the decisions, rational and irrational, as to why it started and the overall view of the war. It will also reflect the tragedy of war where everyone suffers to varying degrees. Many historians have pointed the finger at this conflict as the main reason why the USSR collapsed in 1991. My research indicates that it is a much more complex issue than you might expect. While it was undoubtedly a drain on the Soviet economy, which, as I've mentioned many times in the past, was in pretty terrible shape, it was a drain on the people of the USSR with the loss of numerous lives. But there's something more critical that led to the collapse. What took the country down was the perception of weakness that this war portrayed. The Soviet Union was on the border of Afghanistan. Three of its members, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, were all northern neighbors. The Red Army didn't have to travel halfway around the world to invade the country like the U.S. had to in 2001. When the Soviet-Afghan War began in 1979, the world viewed them as a global power, second only to the United States, and to some, even superior. When they withdrew almost 10 years later, it was considered a sign of extreme weakness, something that would give many of the Eastern Bloc countries hope that they could finally throw off the Soviet yoke. Afghanistan has historically been an almost impossible nation or territory to defeat militarily, as we've seen in our lifetimes. It's been called, quote-unquote, the graveyard of empires, although that might be a bit of an exaggeration. We can go way back to Alexander the Great, considered by many to have been the greatest military leader in history. He had a hell of a time there, and while he was somewhat successful in invading the country, it was at a significant cost. To understand why Afghanistan is such a difficult place to wage a war, I'd like to read a passage from author Gregory Pfeiffer's book, The Great Gamble, The Soviet War in Afghanistan. Quote, Afghanistan's fate has been determined more than anything by its position on the globe. A persuasive current of scholarly theory about the nature of empires has it that geographical determinism, the lay of the land as well as its weather, helps to find which territories become centers of empires and which remain battle-scarred frontier lands lodged between competing powers. Confluences of waterways and other transportation routes and natural defenses help form the centers of power. At the same time, mountains and other geographical features on the peripheries have long been intrinsic impediments to conquest. Deserts, river valleys, and narrow mountain passes, in which Afghanistan is rich, have greatly favored the resident peoples who know them. Much as Vietnam was a difficult place to wage war with the United States in the 1960s and 70s, so too was Afghanistan for the Soviet Union. One could have assumed that Soviet leadership would have gained some insight from their Cold War adversary's failure, but they didn't. They should have known that the U.S. would support the Afghans in their fight against the Red Army, but they didn't. They could have taken lessons from the British and their difficulties when they had a marginal rule over Afghanistan, but they didn't. Russia, before its collapse, had a great interest in Afghanistan back in the mid-19th century. But they were stymied by Great Britain, which feared Russian expansionism in Central Asia. 
They believe that any such influence growth could jeopardize their interests in India. This led to something known as the Great Game, which I will cover in an episode in early March. It would also be part of the reason for the Crimean War, but right now we're going a little bit off course here. Soviet interest in Afghanistan began early on in the 1920s. After World War II, the USSR would supply military and economic aid to its southern neighbor. Soviet-Afghan military cooperation began on a regular basis in 1956 and continued through the mid-1970s. They would also send advisors and specialists to aid their economy. So why did the Soviet leadership, and in particular Leonid Brezhnev, decide to invade Afghanistan? According to Pfeiffer, it was partly due to, quote, Brezhnev's superficial but emotional tie to the country's first communist president, Mohammed Taraki. It was principal cause of the Soviet invasion. The president's ouster and murder offended the Soviet leader, especially because Hafezullah Amin, Taraki's rival, had promised the Kremlin he'd do no such thing. Nevertheless, Taraki's killing served more as a pretext for action than a motive. In the years leading up to the invasion, two factions within Afghanistan were vying for power. The Marxist People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan openly split in 1967 with the Khalq, or Masses, faction led by Nur Muhammad Taraki on one side and the Parsham, or flag faction, led by Babrak Kamal on the other. After much infighting, the Kalak side prevailed. On December 5, 1978, a treaty of friendship was signed between the Soviet Union and Afghanistan. Taraki was made prime minister, and Hafezullah Amin was made deputy prime minister. Unfortunately for the Afghan people, this duo would begin their version of Red Terror. They wanted to purge the country of the Parsham followers. It is estimated that between 50 to 80,000 people were executed in 1978 and 79. The 18 months of reforms, as they called it, within Afghanistan would cause great strife, especially within the more conservative Muslim community. This would be the spur to the development of the Mujahideen, the rebel movement led by Osama bin Laden that would take on both the Soviet Union and later the United States. Taraki, seeing this as a threat to his government, sent a message to Alexei Kosygin, chairman of the USSR Council of Ministers, asking for, quote, practical and technical assistance with men and armament. Kasigan was not convinced that this was a good idea. He was quoted as saying, We believe it would be a fatal mistake to commit ground troops. If our troops went in, the situation in your country would not improve. On the contrary, it would get worse. Our troops would have to struggle not only with an external aggressor, but with a significant part of your own people. And the people would never forgive such things. After getting rejected by Kosygin, Taraki went above him by requesting aid from General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev. He also warned Taraki that Soviet intervention, quote, would only play into the hands of our enemies, both yours and ours. Well, these warnings and concerns made it doubly incredulous with the decision to invade that would come in December 1979. Brezhnev would try again and again to convince Taraki to ease up on the reforms and the red terror being inflicted on the Parshams. His reply to Soviet Ambassador Alexander Puzanov, when he asked Taraki to spare two Parsham leaders, was, quote, Lenin taught us to be merciless toward the enemies of the revolution, and millions of people had to be eliminated in order to secure the victory of the October Revolution. Well, this revolt in Afghanistan began in October 1978, initially by the Nuristani tribes of the Kunar Valley 
in the northeastern part of the country near the border with Pakistan. As word of the rebellion spread, numerous other ethnic groups joined. By springtime, there were violent outbreaks in 24 out of the 28 provinces in Afghanistan. The Afghan army began to disintegrate during the rebellion. In 1978, there were about 110,000 soldiers. By late 1979, there were only 25,000. As the U.S. ambassador in Kabul relayed to Washington, soldiers fled, quote, like an ice floe in a tropical sea. Seeing this as a chance to cause problems for the Soviets, certain U.S. advisors began to suggest to then-President Jimmy Carter that they might want to begin providing aid to the rebels. This was met with some concern by others, though. National Intelligence Officer Arnold Horlick warned, quote, Covert action would raise the cost to the Soviets and inflame Muslim opinion against them in many countries. The risk was that a substantial U.S. covert aid program could raise the stakes and induce the Soviets to intervene more directly and vigorously than otherwise intended. Well, the aid, though, would start to flow through Pakistan. This would encourage the rebels, which pre precipitate the 1979 Herat Uprising. Several Soviet advisors were killed in March 1979. This would lead to heavy retribution from the Afghan army with Soviet aid. It is estimated that between 10 and 25,000 citizens were killed in the subsequent aerial bombardment and recapture of Herat. Although the Soviets provided equipment, they still would not send in any troops. Between April and June 1979, the Soviets began to send in helicopters and tanks with full crews into the beleaguered Afghan capital of Kabul. They would take control of the Bagram and Shindand air bases, but still refused to send any additional ground troops. With the situation rapidly deteriorating, a special commission on Afghanistan, comprising the KGB chairman Yuri Andropov, Boris Ponomarev from the Central Committee, and Dmitry Ustinov, the Minister of Defense, was formed. With Hafizullah Amin now leading Afghanistan after the murder of Taraki, the Soviets became more and more concerned that they were losing influence to both Pakistan and China, with whom their relationship had fallen on hard times. Amin was purging pro-Soviet members of leadership along with Amin's supposed meetings with the U.S. Chargé d'Affaires, J. Bruce Amstutz. This final insult was used as justification for the invasion by the Kremlin. Whether this meeting actually took place is immaterial. The paranoia of the Soviet leadership of the day forced them into the decision. It would eventually lead to their doom. I guess you can rationalize the decision to invade Afghanistan, considering their forays into relationships with Pakistan, China, and their biggest enemy, America. Still, the level of incompetency that led to this was staggering. Rumors were flying around the Kremlin that Amin was a CIA agent, that his ministers were the ones stoking the flames of rebellion, and other outlandish scenarios, one more absurd than the other. Suffice it to say, Soviet leadership decided that enough was enough and that the threat in Afghanistan was far too significant to stand idly by. They also made the decision to assassinate Amin as soon as possible. When looking at a conflict as complex as the Soviet-Afghan war and the baffling choices made by the Kremlin, you must take a much broader view of world politics and events. In neighboring Iran, at the same time, the Islamic Revolution overthrew the government of the monarchical government of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, replacing him with the Ayatollah Khomeini. With the sparks of an Islamic Jihad, fears in Soviet leadership of this spreading to countries like Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan were heightened. In my humble opinion, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. 
It led to the inevitable decision to invade Afghanistan, a country that was already socialist with a strong lead into communism. This was also what confounded many within the Kremlin leadership. While aiding a rebellion against capitalism was perfectly justifiable, what was the real justification here? It just did not fit neatly into the Leninist Marxist, Marxist definition of a just war. According to the book, The Soviet Afghan War, How a Superpower Fought and Lost, written by the Russian general staff and translated by Lester Grau and Michael Kress, a peculiar omission came to light regarding how the general staff operated. They write, quote, Why did the general staff fail to document and analyze the Soviet-Afghan war in the same fashion as they had done with previous wars? The most likely explanation is that there was an ideological blind spot in the Marxist-Leninists' tenets. They further went on to write, Therefore, since the Mujahideen uprising did not fit within the Marxist-Leninist definition of a just war, the general staff was constrained in dealing completely with it, and so tried to ignore it. This may also explain why the Soviet Union went into the war in Afghanistan on December 24, 1979, with no clear plan for victory. Its sole purpose was to support the pro-Soviet government installed during Operation Storm 333. The Kremlin's reluctance earlier in the year led them to send in far fewer troops than anticipated. During the Vietnam War, the U.S. had increased its presence with over 500,000 soldiers. By contrast, the Soviet Union's strength wavered between 90 to 120,000 in a country five times the size of Vietnam. Going back to the book by the Russian general staff, quote, the Soviets' four divisions, five separate brigades, three separate regiments, and smaller support units of the 40th Army strained to provide security for the 29 provincial centers and the few industrial and economic installations and were hard-pressed to extend the security to the thousands of villages, hundreds of miles of communication routes, and key terrain features that punctuated and spanned that vast region. The invasion that ensued was met with immediate condemnation from most of the world. Foreign ministers from 34 Muslim-majority countries adopted a resolution that condemned the Soviet intervention and demanded, quote, the immediate, urgent, and unconditional withdrawal of Soviet troops. Of course, the American response on January 4, 1980, was harsh and decisive. President Jimmy Carter said this to the American people, quote, Massive Soviet military forces have invaded the small, non-aligned sovereign nation of Afghanistan, which had hitherto not been an occupied satellite of the Soviet Union. This is a callous violation of international law and the United Nations Charter. If the Soviets are encouraged in this invasion by eventual success, and if they maintain their dominance over Afghanistan and then extend their control to adjacent countries, the stable, strategic, and peaceful balance of the entire world will be changed. This would threaten the security of all nations, including, of course, the United States, our allies, and our friends. The ensuing embargoes placed on the Soviet Union were another nail in their financial coffin. The United Nations passed a resolution protesting the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan by a vote of 104 to 18. In another hit on their national pride, 66 nations boycotted the 1980 Moscow Summer Olympic Games. Support for the Mujahideen would flow through Pakistan, with supplies coming from the U.S., the People's Republic of China, Britain, France, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates. All in all, there would be seven different factions within Afghanistan that would fight against the USSR. Three were considered moderate. The other four was, were Islamic fundamentalists. 
According to the research I've dug up, the Pakistani authorities favored the fundamentalists and would give them a larger portion of the military and humanitarian aid. The fight that ensued would have two major phases. The first one was the Soviets trying to destroy the support that the Mujahideen received from the countryside. They did this by devastating the irrigation systems, farms, granaries, and by killing their livestock and placing mines in their agricultural fields. This phase would last between 1980 and 85, and instead of having the average Afghan citizen turn against the rebels, it reinforced their resolve. The next phase occurred when the Mujahideen began to create bases from which they could attack Soviet lines of communications, military compounds, and roads that they used to transport supplies and soldiers. This would begin in 1985 until the war ended. What made this war so difficult, or basically impossible for the Soviets to win, was why the Afghani people were fighting. It wasn't for some ideology like communism or capitalism, although some were fighting for their deeply religious beliefs. They weren't really fighting for a government. They were fighting for the lives of their families and their way of living. The fundamentalists had a rallying call as the USSR was considered an atheistic government, something that Muslims could not stand for, regardless of how conservative their faith was. Over the nine years, one month, three weeks, and one day that the Soviet-Afghan war was fought, the cost in human lives was, and to this day, somewhat unknown. Now, the official number of Soviet casualties were 13,833 dead, but according to several sources, it was likely to be at least twice that many. Of those on the Afghani side that fought with the Soviets, they lost over 40,000 men. Still, compared to the losses suffered by the Afghan people, it pales in comparison. The military arm of the rebellion lost between 75 and 90,000 lives. Estimates of civilian deaths range between a low of 562,000 to a high of 2 million. If we go by the higher number, that would have represented approximately 10% of the total population of Afghanistan at the time. When Mikhail Gorbachev was elected to the head of the Soviet Union in 1985, he knew immediately that the war had to begin to wind down. His economy could not stand it, and he wanted to promote his ideas of glasnost, rejoin the world and build a better, more just Soviet Union. By then, though, the damage had already been done. It would take four additional years before the last Soviet troops left Afghanistan, leaving behind a divided country with warlords controlling large swaths of the countryside. It also armed the extremist sides of the Mujahideen, leading to the eventual attack on the United States on September 11, 2001. Between the withdrawal in 1992, a civil war raged on, costing an additional 400,000 Afghan civilian lives. In 1992, the Taliban gained control of most of the country, with pockets of fierce resistance remaining. There were no winners in the Soviet-Afghan war, but a pair of losers. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Join me next time when we begin a three-part series on the people's perspective of the Russian Civil War, the Crimean War, and the Russian Revolution. Again, this is not about the battles. This is about what the people were feeling, their fears, what they saw in the countryside, which they saw in the cities. So it's going to be a very emotional three-part series, and I hope you enjoy those. So, until next time, das vidanya, is pasiba za